Fay Fay Ad presents St. Charbel, Holiness from Lebanon at the 2018 Lenten Series. Shall we start with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Father God Almighty, we thank you, we praise you. We thank you for the precious blood of your only begotten Son. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that keeps reminding us of the love that you have for us. We come before you this evening to open our hearts, minds, and souls to the message that we have through the life of St. Charvel. We pray to our Mama Mary that she will be also with us as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, what would a person share and talk about a saint? It is uh, such a humbling experience, to be honest. And uh, I'm grateful for that privilege to share about uh, a wonderful Lebanese saint, uh, just because he is from the old country and it makes me proud of him. Um, on May 5th, you can't hear? Oh, okay. Sure, sure. Thank you. <laughs> well, just to give you a little quote, uh, Saint Charbel always uh, said, "If you want to, if you want your soul to be saved, go to Mama Mary, because uh, she will always help you to get to heaven." So he had a very special, very special love and. Um, uh, how do you say, a close relationship with our mother. Can you hear? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I'll try to speak louder too, so. Uh, on May 5th of 1828, the family of Antun Mahlouf from Beka Kafra, those are different names for you, and that's because it's in Lebanon. They welcomed uh, their fifth child, Yusuf, which is Joseph, and uh, Joseph was baptized on May 16 of 1828. Joseph and his siblings were raised in a very loving and strict Christian home. Antun Makhlouf, his father, died when Joseph was three years old. And uh, two of his uh, uncles, who are his maternal uncles, they were already uh, at a monastery in a hermitage at St. Anthony Azhaya, and that's also in one of the mountains in Lebanon. Those two uh, uncles were very influential in forming and uh, putting so much desire in Joseph's heart uh, to serve God and to really uh, give his life to God. He, uh, they spoke to him about uh, monasticism and many times he heard them say, and I will quote uh, different places because uh, those are important how he was formed and how he grew up to be the great saint that he is. Uh, they always told him, uh, whoever desires to find the Lord, to live with him in perfect intimacy, must break away from every worldly vanity and to enter into himself. So let go of everything and just, um, you know, search within. To be a monk is to be alone. And the Greek word is monachos, which means to live alone. 
and it signifies that a man or a woman who flees the world for solitude in God's company. When he was 14, uh, his friends and uh, the, in the village that he lived, they always teased him and they used to call him, oh, here comes the saint, because he refused to um, participate in their uh, bad language sometimes and the uh, activities that they did that he didn't feel that it was pleasing to God. So whenever they teased him, he would just go away and he had found this beautiful grotto, just a little grotto, and he made it as a little shrine for our mother. So he will take some incense from church and uh, take a little candle and he will go to the grotto and pray the litany to our mother and uh, just uh, use the incense to bless her picture. And so this was his little private chapel. And above that grotto, there was a beautiful uh, hill or a beautiful rock that, uh, that was his little place to meditate. And he was 14 years old. So one time when he was praying and meditating, he heard a voice saying to him, leave everything and follow me. I am the Christ. And so uh, Joseph, he had such a yearning for God, but of course, you know, he was a teenager at the time. Um, he heard it, but he didn't say or do anything about it. And one time, while he was working in the fields, he used to tend uh, the goats and uh, you know watch where they're going and everything. He lost one of his goats. And so he went looking for her everywhere. And all of a sudden, there was this little chapel. And he entered the chapel, went down on his knees, and asked God, and he said, Dear Lord, let me belong to you, body and soul. And then in that silence, while he was there, he heard again and again, leave everything and follow me. Leave everything and follow me. So Joseph said yes to God. And he went about you know, his business. At age 23, one evening at night, <coughs> He got dressed and left the house and went to the monastery of Our Lady of Maifouk, which is also in one of the mountain areas. And no one knew, no one knew that he had made that decision. He hasn't told anyone in his family. And he just took off. And while he was walking, a voice started speaking to him and said, what are you doing? You're leaving everything? You're leaving the people who love you? You're giving up your freedom? You're giving up the joys of this world? And then he thought for a minute, and then he heard his uncle's voices, <laughs> and then, um, determined that I will keep on going. And then he was reminded, as his uncles used to say, look for God, Joseph. Here on earth, all is vanity. God is your only happiness. Worldly pleasures are temporal. Their desires quickly fade away. And death will too soon be calling. The wise man is he who prepares his soul for the day of reckoning. So before Joseph was accepted to be a, a novice, uh, they allowed him to stay for eight days, and uh, he did not have a habit or any, you know, any uh, uh, monk uh, garb at the time. They allowed him to keep his secular, secular clothing, and, but to work with the novices in different activities at the monastery. When his mother found out, she wept for days, wept and wept. 
And then slowly her heart uh, became lighter and her anguish became less and less. And then she realized that God is really honoring her by asking her son to come into the monastery to serve him. So she was more uh, agreeable with the idea of him going into the monastery. After two years in the novitiate, Brother Sharbel was grounded in the vital obligations obedience, poverty, and chastity. Obedience is the virtue that really um, conditioned his spirituality uh, because he wanted to do everything, everything he wanted to do, every movement, every, he, he wanted to serve God completely. He wanted to surrender everything to God. He didn't want anything from this world just to be with God. Uh, the people who were around him, different people's testimonies, when I was reading his books and everything, they said, we always felt that he was up, he was somewhere else, even though physically he was there, but he was always above, you know, just yearning for the higher, for the heavens. And um, I'm sorry, just... So when it was time for him to uh, be a monk, he determined and was not um, using his name Joseph, even though Joseph would have been accepted by his superiors because it's a saint's name. He wanted to detach himself completely uh, from the world because uh, the name Joseph which is, in a way breaks my heart because I'm a mom, <laughs> it reminded him of his mother's love. And he didn't want to be attached to that. So he decided to use the name Charvel. And that's where Charvel came, <laughs> you know. For all this time, his name was Joseph. <laughs> and the name Charvel was made famous by a martyr of the Church of Antioch in the year 107. And the origin of the name is Aramaic. And being a combination of Sharbo, which is C-H-A-R-B-O, and E-I-L, L, Sharbel, meaning God's good news. And, uh, Talk about <laughs> complete surrender, you know. On November 1st, 1853, a mass was celebrated in the presence of the superior, the novice master, and the monks of the monastery, and Brother Charbel took the monastic vows. And uh, during the mass, the superior will ask, Brother Charbel about his readiness to observe all these vows. And after giving affirmative replies, I will quote his uh, oath. I, Brother Charbel, promise God Almighty in the presence of my most reverend Father General to commit myself to obedience, chastity, and voluntary poverty until death according to our rule and order. So after he pronounced his vows, there is, uh, I'm sure if you have uh, children who are priests or nuns who are, I mean, daughters who are nuns, there is a special ceremony and there is a lot of uh, uh, symbolism of the garb and the way they you know, do that. So at uh, the monastery, the first thing is they cut his hair. To show his dedication, he was then dressed in a black monastic habit. Uh, they, uh, the angelic cowl, which is the hood, the belt of the order, the tassel, and the habit. Each of these have their own special meaning and is very important symbol in the novitiate's transition 
to monkhood. Black represents dying to the world. The black garb means that the monk has withdrawn from the world and all things worldly. By wearing the habit, the cloth of the poor, the monk proclaims his poverty. The angelic cowl, which is the hood, is what the angel gave to Saint Anthony the Great. It symbolizes the purity of the monk who has forsaken the world and renounced his desire for marriage and children. By wearing the cowl, the monk proclaims his chastity and celibacy, his total commitment to the will of God. The belt symbolizes the monk's fidelity and chastity. The black tassel reminds us of the whip used to scourge Jesus. Every time the monk touches the tassel, he says, with your pain, O Jesus Christ. The robe symbolizes the plea to God to protect the monk. It means that the monk is in God's care. After he was vested, then it was a big celebration and a procession uh, in the community and for all uh, the people in, their, in the village. For his formation and education, he spent six years from 1853 uh, to 1859 studying philosophy and theology. On July 23rd, 1859, Brother Sherbel was ordained as a Catholic Maronite priest at the Maronite Patriarchate in Kirke, Lebanon. Now, if some of you hear Maronite, it is not Mennonite. <laughs> so you will know that the Maronite rite is basically the Syrian rite, also they call it, which is very much like the Catholic rite, except uh, there is a little bit uh, difference in the, f in the uh, form of the Mass. And uh, the uh, Eucharistic prayer is always uh, said in the Aramaic language, in the, in the Lord's language. After his ordination, uh, he was assigned to return to St. Maroon's Monastery in Anaya, Mount Lebanon. And during those 16 years, uh, Father Charbel was as uh, dedicated as uh, a servant, basically, to his community. He just gave himself completely uh, to his community. And whatever he was asked, he never questioned, he never um, said anything uh, that will offend or hurt anybody. They all were amazed at the way that this uh, priest was. Now, it was very difficult for him. He wanted to be a hermit so bad. And he asked his superior three times, and his superior said no. Then the fourth time he went, every once in a while he will go back and say, would you please give me permission to be a hermit? And uh, he also said no. Well, on that occasion, um, he was given an assignment to write a documentary by his superior, and he told him that he needs to have it done the next day. And uh, back then, you know, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he always told him, whatever is difficult, give me, give me, I will do it. So he was working all day, getting his papers ready and, you know, trying to get all that stuff done. And uh, his uh, lamp, you know, they didn't have electricity, so they had oil lamps. And two of the servants in the kitchen were working and uh, so he went and said, uh, will you please fill my lamp with oil, with oil because it's all empty. And they wanted to play a trick on him. So they emptied his lamp completely from oil and filled it with water. And they gave it to him. And to their amazement, that lamp was lit. 
the whole night. So they were standing behind his cell and looking, and they see the light. And so then one of the servants felt so bad, he, he got scared, and he went straight to the superior late at night to confess. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the superior woke up and he said, what's going on? I have to confess, I did something terrible to Father Sherville. And so they told him what happened. And he said, okay, okay. And he went to uh, Father Sherville's uh, cell and he saw that there was some light there. So he opened the cell and he said, what are you doing still up late? You know, you're supposed to be in bed by such and such time. Uh, well. He didn't argue, he said, I am sorry, I apologize. He didn't say, well, you told me that I need to get this paper, nothing. And he said, give me this lamp. And he took it and went to his desk, to his uh, office, and checked it. And true, there's only water there. So he decided that he will have him go and live in a hermitage. And so, to, to, be a her, to be a hermit and to live as a hermit is uh, it's not easy. And so I looked to see what a hermit, <laughs> how a hermit should live. <laughs> and uh, he was granted that uh, special you know, uh, approval on February 15 of 1875. Well, as a hermit, <laughs> Uh, there is a, uh, a lot of rules, and some of them are listed here. He must say mass and visit the chapel frequently, night and day. He must pray, meditate, and read the Holy Scriptures and Bible. He must do, and, and I think here when you, they say Holy Scriptures because, uh, you know, our, uh, the Maronite rite, and I think in the Catholic faith, I'm not sure, Father, there is also, uh, you know, the Catholic uh, scriptures, you know, as um, teachings. So he means here, when he says the Holy Scriptures, it's the church's teachings, the Maronite rite teachings. He must do manual labor as a powerful remedy for many temptations, as a proof that he is not deserting his human obligations and in accordance with the stern injunction of St. Paul. If any if anyone will not work, neither let him eat. <laughs> he must live a life of strict poverty. He, Father Sherbill did penance alone and in silence. And the rule states, the hermit can eat only one meal a day, which is sent by the monastery. So really in his hermitage, in that little area that he is in, there is no Oh, I'm hungry, I'll get a snack or whatever, nothing. So whatever they send him, once a day. He must never eat meat or drink wine. During Lent, he can only have vegetables with a little oil. He must not sleep more than five hours. Forget sleeping in then. <laughs> he must observe strict silence. In case of necessity, he must speak briefly and in subdued tones. He must not leave the hermitage without the express consent of his superior. But for him, it was like that was the best thing that you have given Father Sharpel. At the hermitage, the Eucharist was his joy. It was the center of his life. Uh, he, though he did not have a place you know, in the world, but the world was all in his heart praying for the world to come to know God. One of his uh, quotes here, it says, the war of, evil, of the evil one against the Lord is his war against the family. And the war of the evil one against the family is the core of his war against the Lord. Because the family is the image of God from the beginning of the creation of this universe. The evil one is focusing on destroying the family, the foundation of God's plan. So his heart ached for the people in the world. He wanted them to know God, to live a godly life, to be close to the lover of our souls. 
So it was in his uh, secluded sanctuary that he spent 23 years. 23 years he was a hermit. He made many sacrifices. He slept uh, on a pillow uh, that is a piece of wood. And it was wrapped with an old cloth from an old habit, from you know the monk's habits. His bed was made of goat's hair on the ground. He slept on the ground. Uh, everything that was mortif mortification, you know, for he was always into that state of um, just <coughs> surrendering completely, accepting, accepting everything that God wanted him to go through. Every day he started his day with adoration of the Eucharist, prayers, celebrated the Holy Mystery. Uh, he fasted. Uh, they say the people who were, because uh, when they have a hermitage, some hermitages are uh, close by, but uh, they don't, uh, you know, they don't <coughs> visit and, you know, <laughs> Uh, have uh, a coffee time or whatever. <laughs> so uh, he always worked hard, you know, physical labor, uh, didn't sleep much. They always said that he was not, he, he would not sleep a lot. He would just pray. They saw him many times, hours and hours, on his knees with his arms lifted up like this in prayer. On December 16 of uh, 1898, while he was reciting the prayer of the Holy Liturgy, uh, Father Charbel suffered a stroke. His companion, uh, Father Makarios al Mishmishani, and other monks helped him to his cell. Eight days later, on December 24th, he died. And that really marked the 23 years in total abandonment to God. Beginning on the night of his death, after they um, buried him. Now, uh, just to give you an idea, in Lebanon, even now, when a person dies, the next day they're buried. They, like here, we can maybe uh, wait for a few days until family and friends and everybody comes. Over there, it's the next day. They die, the next day they're buried. But in his time back then, uh, they didn't uh, have like nice uh, caskets like we know we have now and everything. They just uh, had, you know, just a little wooden casket and they dug the ground and buried him. Light was radiating from where his tomb was, where they buried him, from the same night after they buried him. And so four months later, they got uh, a permission from the Catholic uh, Church authorities, and the superior opened the tomb for the first time on April 15, 1899. So it was four months after he had died. His body was found intact, um, just like he had just died, and his body was... Um, uh, like uh, dripping blood-like moisture. It was like sweating, basically, blood-like moisture. <coughs> and uh, so then, of course, they moved him, put him in a different casket, and uh, they put new clothes on him, and they kept the other ones because they were soaking, you know, from uh, the sweat. So this time they thought, okay, we'll put him in the monastery and the, uh, what do you call it, like a mausoleum, you know, in the wall. Well, the wall, after, you know, a few weeks or whatever, if somebody was walking by and they saw the wall was dripping. And then they had to take him out and look, and he was still in that same, you know, miraculous, um, uh, incorruptible body. Between 1950 and 1975, his tomb was opened eight times because 
every time they needed to have him more examined and doctors will come from France, from Italy, from all over and they check and there are more details, you know, one of, this is one of, I love this book, but there is a lot of other books about him. Uh, the doctors will just set him up like he would, like, you know, <laughs> and he's not like he's stiff, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, many accounts on how they just have him sit and everything is just, um, is it malleable or whatever, you know, I mean, he's, and there is no medical, you know, explanation to that, uh, of the incorruptibility and the flexibility of Father Sherville's <laughs> body. <laughs> so all of these, but then during all that time from especially uh, after he died and after they found that his body was incorruptible, people will come from all the different towns on crutches, blind, uh, you name it, sicknesses, and they will be healed. Many, 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 hundreds of thousands by now healings that have taken place through his intercession. But the beauty of it is when I was preparing, you know, um, I told my daughter today, I said, you know, I knew of him, I knew about him, I've read his story, but boy, I'm buddies with him now. <laughs> and Sandra started laughing and she said, why do you say that? I said, because there is so much, every time you read about a saint, you learn more things, you know, you see more things. His focus all his life was God. It wasn't him, it wasn't anything else. And so when I was, you know, preparing to give the talk about him, he kept like whispering in my heart, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about him. It's about him, the lover of your soul. And uh, this is what even made me love him more, is that humble, spirit, obedience, humility, and silence. You know, we don't really know how powerful silence is. And I have learned from different saints, and when I've done my devotions and everything, the Lord always say, come into the silence. Come into the silence. And uh, so when uh, I was, uh, looking at some of the quotes that he had said, one of them, it says that um, your solitary prayer, when you are praying by yourself, your prayer places you in God's heart. When you are praying a family prayer, your prayer places you in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. When you are in a community, a church prayer, then you are strengthened in the body of Christ. So it's not like uh, we are all asked to be silent and pray in silence all the time. No, there is power in different ways of prayers that we can be involved in and receive the graces and the blessings of those prayers. So that was one of the things that I thought, yes, yes, I like that. Another thing is um, he was a person who will always tell you how much God loves you. God loves you. God loves you, loves you, loves, loves everybody. He loves me. Day by day, he just rose higher and higher in that thought that God loves you. What a blessing, you know, because sometimes we, f we feel like, oh, I, I, no, there is no way that God will love me. No, God is merciful and loving. And he always, um, he always prayed, oh, Father of truth, your son is here, a victim ready to do your bidding. What a beautiful prayer. What a beautiful prayer. And uh, the monastic rule uh, considers the role of silence fundamental. <laughs> the monk must observe silence with discernment 
not just, you know, like, okay, I'm silent, but no, discernment is important. So the rule, therefore, invited the monks to observe what St. Benedict called the eloquence of silence. The fact is that without silence, there can be no thanksgiving. So when we sit in silence, that spirit of thanksgiving should well up from within. And then all of a sudden, we are in that thanksgiving mode because we are in the quiet. For Sharbel to break this stillness would interfere with one's ability to consecrate, uh, concentrate and cause you to lose the benefits of silence. And there was no point in idle conversation in his, in his uh, mind, okay, if there is no, you know, there is nothing gonna come out of this, don't talk. Don't <laughs> even try. One of the monks came to visit him one day and he entered his cell and he greeted him. That's the account of this monk who went to visit him. And he pointed to a chair and he sat in the chair. And then he, he brought him the book, the Bible, on one of the chapters in St. Paul's messages. The monk read it and then he gave it back. And then Charville left. And the guy, that's it, that was the visit. No talk, no talk whatsoever. He said, that was it. I left, I left his cell and I knew that was what he, you know, what God wanted me to hear or know. But Sharbil, he didn't open his mouth at all. So that was his way. His way was if, if there is no, uh, no point in idle conversation, it threatened to waste the heavenly perfume that lingered after morning's communion. So for him, that's, that's all it was. It's the perfume from heaven, the silence. God alone was at the center of Charbel's spirit. Now, uh, after, of course, many, many uh, uh, miracles and uh, uh, to prove that uh, he is worthy, at the closing of the Second Vatican uh, Council on December 5th of 1965, Father Charbel was beatified by a po a Pope Paul VI, who said, a hermit, a hermit of Mount Lebanon is enrolled in the number of the blessed. A new eminent member of monastic sanctity has by his example and his intercession enriched the entire Christian people. May he make us understand in a world largely fascinated by wealth and comfort, the paramount value of poverty, penance, and asceticism, which is self-discipline, to liberate the soul in its ascent to God. On October 9, 1977, Pope Paul VI, presided at the canonization of Blessed Charbel. And that was, we were here and for some reason uh, we turned the TV on and all of a sudden I see a Maronite mass on television. I said, Mike, look at this. Uh, there is a Maronite mass. <laughs> oh, and it's in Rome. <laughs> and then the next thing is, they were canonizing St. Charwell. <laughs> so it was a very special uh, day. And um, basically, this is, uh, how, do, how do I say it? This is just a little glimpse of uh, his life and uh, the way that uh, St. Charbel lived and how God honored his, uh, really, obedience and love for God. So thank you very much. I wanted to mention also, I had made copies, but I really had no idea that there would be that many people. Uh, and I told sister, if, uh, if you are interested, I had made copies of a novena to St. Charbel. And if you are interested, you, can, you are welcome to come and get it. 
And if we don't have any more and people still want them, I'll be more than happy to make more copies for you. And uh, St. Chavez, pray for us. <laughs>